Hi, this is Nisha, and we're going to be doing the German field trials of the 1950s, at least kind of a recreation or discussion on Germany's selection of its first rifle post-World War II, and I really should say West Germany, specifically the Bundeswehr. Now, in the past, we did a video on the selection of the G36, which also, of course, delved into later guns like the G11. But today, we're going to look at the first ones. So, on the table, we have first the Gewehr G1, the Gewehr 1, the G1. We also have what they designated as the Gewehr 2, the G2. Then the Gewehr 3. G3, and finally the Gewehr 4, the G4. Now standing in for these, this gun here is an original G1 kit assembled onto a DSA Type 1 receiver. So it's quite authentic. This of course is my STGW 57, PE 57, assembled onto one of Honey Creek's receivers. You've seen this in many videos over the years. This is an original Swiss parts set. It's also quite authentic and not a bad representative for the trials. For our G3, I selected my Spanish Set Me Sport. Mars. It's not an exact representation of a, of a G3 from the trials, but it's quite close because they were modified Spanish set me model B's and this is a Spanish model C. I thought it would be closer than pulling out a more modern HK type. And finally the newest gun my Brownells BR-10A. This is their semi-auto modern recreation of a, of a Dutch, specifically a Sudanese contract, AR-10. And while there are, of course, numerous minor differences between this and what the trials would have had in them, it's pretty good, honestly, for what we're doing today. We at least get the point across because the German trials AR-10s were kind of an early Sudanese or late Cuban pattern. Well, as you know, Germany kind of led the charge during World War II with a more modern military style rifle, the uh, MP44, STG-44. Now that rifle was select fire. It was fed from detaching 30 round mags. It was made with modern techniques, mostly stampings had a gas system, so on and so forth. We have videos on it. Now it did fire an intermediate caliber cartridge, eight millimeter curves, 7.92 by 33. So it was really a true assault rifle by any definition. And some of these would remain in both West and East German service after the war, as would the Mauser Car 98K which of course was the carbine version of the World War I Gewehr 98. Also, West Germany would, would receive M1 Grands, M1 Carbines, and even M2 Carbines from the West. So this is what equipped the Bundeswehr in the late 40s and into the 50s. Also at that time, Germany was not allowed to build firearms. But in the 1950s, their guns were aging, and also NATO was going to a new caliber, the 30 caliber light rifle cartridge, which we know is 7.62 NATO today, 7.62 by 51, which was really a development in America, kind of militarizing the 300 Savage cartridge. There's a lot of back and forth. Originally, they were going to do something more intermediate. The British had the 280, which would have been an excellent round for this gun here, the FAL. But in the end, the U.S. had its way, being the most dominant after that war. And so they basically adopted a modernized 30-06 on the 
other hand, most NATO members were going to more modern select fire guns using detachable mags, often 20 rounds. So this was a pretty big round to be fired select fire. So these guns were really known as battle rifles more than assault rifles. They really were too big, too heavy, and firing too, too heavy of a round for that. All right, so enter this critter here, or re rather its immediate predecessor. This is an FNFAL. Tons of history on this guy. I mean, the right arm of the free world used by dozens upon dozens of nations. Its start in West Germany began in 1954. FN demonstrated what was called at the time the Canadian model, because Canada was the first nation to officially adopt the FAO. It demonstrated the Canadian model to the West German Border Guard. Also, we often call the BGS. They liked it. And so the following year, 1955, they, they ordered some. Now, first they would receive 100 what we call in the FAL community Type A's. These would have early features, wood hand guards, a simple lugged barrel without a flash hider. The flash hider was actually part of the bayonet, kind of this and that, that had tall sights, so on and so forth. They would get a hundred of those. Then they would get basically what we call a Type B, which did have a flash hider, still had tall sights, and they would get between 15 and 2,000 of those critters. They did look at the Setme from Spain, but I will revisit that when we get to the G3, I think, instead of muddying the waters. Let's just say in 1956, they selected the FAL, what we call today the BGS model, as standard, and they would order about 4,800 in early autumn of that year. I think it was around August or September of 56. The major differences between these later BGS guns and the earlier, they would go to these pressed metal handguards. Also, this folding light bipod. Boop. But they would still pretty much use the Type B flash hider, and they would still have the tall sights. And they would often have wood pistol grips as well and send them to wood carry handles. Boop. Well, the Bundeswehr, who had also been looking into the Setme, which at that time, 1956, was on the Model 2 or the Model A, obtained about 10 of the newer BGS models, very similar to this, and really liked them. So much so that in November they had a contract with FN in Belgium to deliver 100,000. The first 50 were due, excuse me, yeah, that'd be great. The first 50,000 were due quite quickly. It was by February of 1957, so just a few months off. I would have to imagine that FN had quite a few ready to go. They were kind of going into full production at the time. And then the other 50,000 were due by March of 1958. Now this is important, I'm not just rambling for the sake of it, even though I do love talking about FALs. So by the early part of 1958, they would have 100,000, give or take, in the Bundeswehr. And they would adopt the FAL as the G1. And it was basically the later Bundes, uh, the uh, BGS model, except they went to the shorter pattern sights, three millimeters shorter, a polymer carry handle, and a polymer pistol grip. And kind of most uniquely, they would go to a detaching flash rider. This actually just twists about 45 degrees and comes off. It's kind of a, inspired by the Type B, but removable. They had a grenade launcher as well as a blank fire adapter for this. And it actually kind of mounts on a lug like a Type A, although the lug is in a different location on the barrel. Anyway, that's the unique G1. And this was standard issue. And the Bundeswehr in 1957, and they were still receiving new rifles into 1958. 
Well, everything was pretty much hunky-dory, but let's keep in mind they had looked very heavily at the Setme in Spain. But had gone with the FN for a couple of reasons, mostly to do with production and the fact that it was capable of firing in the 7.62 NATO cartridge and was a fully matured system by that point. And of course, as the internet most commonly reports, and it is correct, everything was fine until Germany asked, West Germany, asked to have a license to produce the G1 domestically. Okay, now here's where the kind of the controversy might come in a bit. They had to have known FN's in Belgium. Attitude would have not been very positive. FN was happy to sell them guns, but not the production rights to make more guns. So FN wanted control of the number of guns that West Germany had. Why? I mean, the reason's obvious. They were invaded twice in 50 years by the Germans, and it was not a pleasant experience either time. Now, Germany had to know this. They had to know. So some have kind of speculated this was a way of getting out of the G1 and, and moving on to something else and to have new trials. Who, who knows? It was apparently a pretty heated thing, though, at the time. So that opened up essentially trials for a new rifle before even the final G1s were delivered. They started trying guns in 57 and well into 58. And that brings us to the, the four on the table here. Now, the G1 was still obviously going to be in the trials. They had plenty of them, and it's a good standard. They knew it worked, so on and so forth. In comes this gun here. Over in Switzerland, another Germanic company, a country, they had been trying out self-loading and select fire automatic infantry rifles for a long time, since the 40s. Well, this settled on the AM-55, which was turned into the AM-57, adopted as the STGW Sturmgewehr 1957 standard issue. The export name was the SIG SG-510, and this would be a Dash-1. The Dash-1 that Germany would use for its trials would be the same as this gun here, except this one is in the original 7.5 GP11. The 50, uh, excuse me, the 510-1 used would be in 7.6 Tornado, which obviously uh, SIG made for quite a few people. Interestingly, this was really the first time that Switzerland was interested in more of an export market. Before that, it was mostly making rifles only for itself. They would acquire a decent number of these from Switzerland. Couldn't find an exact number. And Wikipedia says in 1956, this seems early because this gun wasn't officially adopted until 57. So probably more like 57 or even into early 58. They might have had some early AM-55 prototypes, but I think the test guns would not have been delivered to at least 57. So this was the Gewehr 2. It was tested, another Germanic company. Obviously, the quality would be what Germans would expect, and it's an interesting rifle to say the least. The Setme was always of interest to West Germany because it was really a derivation and improvement on a World War II design from Germany. The STG 45M by Mauser, which was slated to be the replacement for the STG 44. It also fired 8mm curves, but was designed to be simpler, easier to mass produce, a little lighter, and to address some other issues. It never went into production. Only a few hundred were made, and that's including parts to build them. So the, the 45M didn't, but it's chief designer, more or less, would first go to France and then Spain after the war, working on various guns in different calibers. He would settle in at SETME, which was a research and development, and they received quite a bit of funding beginning in the early 50s to design Spain a new self-loading select fire rifle. And then when NATO kind of went to the 7.62 cartridge, 
at first set me really struggled and they would do a few different versions. They would do a 7.62 set me, which was basically a downloaded NATO cartridge because of the system this uses, and we will get into operating systems. This is why the, uh, the border guards and the, uh, the, the army took a look at the early set me model A's, but I mean, ultimately kind of passed because they were shooting more or less a proprietary cartridge. Yes, it was based on the NATO, but it had a lower powder charge. And that was in 56. But there was interest. In fact, Germany would acquire about 400 early set me rifles. And an up and coming company that no one had ever heard of at the time, known as Heckler and Koch, H and K, they liked using the ampersand back then, would work with SETME to further improve the Model A, and this would lead to the Model B, which was in, introduced in 1958, also known as the Model 58 in Spanish military service as it became their standard issue. There were several changes from the A to the B, but the most important was the B could fire 7.62 NATO with a few parts changes. The early Spanish military still fired 762 sent me, but it was strong enough now to fire the round. So it became the modified Model B became standard for the trials and it was a hybrid between an HK and a set me design. That's why the early G3s that actually look a lot like set me's. We'll get there. And finally, for our last contestant on the table, and my newest gun, the Gewehr 4, the AR-10. This gun has a very interesting history. It was kind of the, la the, the most modern of other guns in oh so many ways construction and also when it came on. They really didn't have any of these ready to go except some early tool room prototypes till 57 and really into 58. Only about four dozen were made in America. Then Armalite would contract with a Dutch firm, AI, to produce them and market them. And this would be where Germany would acquire the G4s. They would actually pick up about 135 from AI. And as I said, they would be kind of a, an in-between version, the Cuban and the, and the uh, Sudanese. The AR-10 was only in production at AI for a, number of, a handful of years, but there were a number of changes made. It was kind of always in constant development. And so, you know, that's what the G4 would be. There are some speculations that there might have been some American parts used in some of the trials guns, but it seems like, at least verifiably so, that they were, but they were Dutch production. And I'd have to think this was the last to really be officially entered into the trials, both because of its development and because it's named G4, which would kind of lead one to assume it was the last to be designated. Alrighty, so there we go. All of these firing 7.62 NATO, they all fed from 20 round detachable mags. Who was the winner? Well, we all know the G3 was. But let's look at these guns a little bit. I don't have space or time to disassemble them, but we can talk a little bit about their features. The G1, which is currently in service, had a 21 inch barrel. As I said, it's got a bipod, metal handguard, Machined receiver, wood stock. Early would have wood grips, then they would go to polymer. It uses stamped steel type mags. It does have a bolt hold open. It is of course select fire, carry handle. It operates using a short stroke gas piston system and a tilting bolt. These are also interesting because they have a highly adjustable gas system with 13 positions. They can also be set easily to turn off the gas entirely to launch grenades. They could take a bayonet, although I don't think West Germany ever issued a bayonet for them. But there is a lug on the hider. 
really from the get-go, this wasn't going to win because of the whole production issue. But it was there in the trials. They knew it worked. It did work well. But it was, it was really just there because it was there. The G1 was not going to win the trials in 58 because they had already decided. So these are already going to be on their way out. After it wasn't selected for adoption, a re-adoption, West Germany would keep using them in some extent. The Border Guard would not only keep their version of the FAL in service into the 80s, they would actually keep buying new parts and even some rifles from FN into the 60s. They would also maybe acquire some from the West Germans, but ultimately they would start phasing these out as early as 1961. Keep in mind they didn't get half of their order till early 1958, so some of these guns were three years old, if even that. But they would start sending them off kind of as aid or whatever, selling them to allies, including most notably Turkey. And that's where most of these G1 kits came from. Although they, they, do, they went elsewhere. They appear in Africa quite frequently. It is a good gun. It is rather heavy by modern standards, over nine pounds. It is long, but kind of svelte at the same time. It's not bulky. Because of the adjustable gas system, recoil is very manageable. The trigger is there. It's a trigger. It's not horrible, but it's not great. They are plenty durable for what they are. They're quite easy to work on. On the other hand, the sights, since the rear sight's mounted to the lower frame and the front sight is mounted to the barrel, they're on different planes and this hinge is open. So accuracy was only acceptable, not match grade with these, depending on the guns. And they were rather t expensive to produce. Now by the 50s, maybe not incredibly so, but as time would go on, having a machined receiver, upper or lower, stamped handguards, wood, this would start to actually get quite expensive. In fact, later in the 70s, FM would go to an investment cast receiver, even on military guns. Still yet, I think the G1 is one of the coolest FAL variants. Can't say otherwise. So what about the new contenders for the trial? What new guns were brought to the table? The SG 510-1 was also in the trials. Now here's the problem. West Germany never really released the results. The trials did go on for quite some time. So we don't really know what exactly was done, how things performed, but obviously the G2 was not selected. And I can see why. It's a neat gun, but if the FAL was a little pricey, this thing would have been expensive to adopt and manufacture. They were just, yeah. And if the FAL was a little long but slender, this is even longer and not as slender. 24 inch barrel. That does include the flash hider, but it's a part of the barrel, so you kind of have to include it. We also have a folding bipod. We have this very interesting barrel shroud and kind of short rubber handguard combo. We have a carry handle, very similar to the FAO. We have front sights that open, or fold up, excuse me, and rear that fold up, they're adjustable. Very tall sights though. Probably a little more durable they are at least, you know, feel a little sturdier, but this again is kind of mounted on the shroud, so it is on a different plane, but they do seem to be okay. Not the most accurate gun in the world, but we have the same kind of interesting rubberized stock, polymer grip. It too has a rock in mag. Now this is the 25 round 7.5 mag. The 20 round 7.62 nano mag is a little bit different, but close enough. The mags themselves are actually alloy and they're machined. Very, I mean, very nice mags, but also expensive. And this is quite a weighty gun. On the other hand, it too is kind of inspired. It uses a roller delayed blowback system. It doesn't have a gas system. So it's much like the STG 
45M, and both of those guns were inspired by the MG42, which had rollers on its bolt, but it also still had a tr conventional gas system. So both of them took it and did their own thing. Now this bolt group is actually very different from a G3 type. It's a different system. Really it is. It's just a roller delay. And as you saw, there's no bolt hold open feature. Has a very small ejection port that was done to kind of prevent stuff from getting in there. It also has a loaded chamber indicator as well as a kind of fold down trigger guard, a trigger for use with gloves. Oop. Has a very conventional <clears throat> selector, much like the FAL on the side here. Again, I don't really know how it performed in the trials. I know it did well in, in Switzerland and its climate, but Switzerland was definitely only looking for a defensive gun and did not need as many as Germany. You have to remember Germany was on the front lines with the communists, the, the fold the gap, the, the, the whole Cold War, so their need was a little more apparent and Switzerland was just adopting and cost was never a big concern to them. So I'm not at all surprised because of that in cost why this did not pass, although it does seem to be quite a durable and reliable gun. But I have to think that it's mostly meant for the hands of well-trained uh, soldiers, not necessarily a young conscript army, because it is a little different, but when well-maintained would be very reliable. But um, I, don't, I, I doubt it seriously ever was considered. I think it was just to have to kind of fill out the roster. And I'm sure there was some interest. I mean, they, they did buy a number of these to try out. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, let's move on to our next contender, the AR-10. Actually, kind of the German trials were one of its highlights because only Portugal and a few other nations really adopted this in any numbers of note. And again, this is the Brownells recreation, so it's based on more of the modern gun, so there's gonna be some features, but you get the general idea. This was an ultra-modern gun by the 50s. It still looks quite modern today. It would have a quite a, white, a lightweight 20-inch barrel with an open-prong flash hider, at least at this time. Later, they would go to a closed. There would be different styles of gas block used with um, different uh, adjustable systems at times. There would also be different bayonet mounting systems. But this would be a direct impingement or at least semi-direct. You do have, technically there is a piston on the bolt carrier, but anyone with AR-15 knowledge gets the idea. That was quite innovative. Not only did it simplify things for fewer moving parts, it also made the thing much lighter weight. And despite what you might hear to the contrary, it's actually very reliable. The bolt itself, is the same kind of multi-lug rotating bolt you're used to in an AR-15 and it recoils directly back into the stock even though the Brownells gun has a more modern tube and, and buffer in it it's still the same principle it is an upper and lower receiver these are made and they always were made out of machined aluminium alloy the furniture for, mil for trials guns and everything was always uh, bakelite or fiberglass it was never wood which is also ultra modern the reason Armalite constructed it like this they were owned by Fairchild who was in the aircraft game so to them even though at the time using it in guns was quite revolutionary they were very accustomed to using different alloys in polymers and synthetics in aircraft and so they kind of scaled that way down and used it in a firearm this combined with Eugene Stoner's contributions for the direct impingement system, as well as actually quite a bit from Melvin Johnson early on with the bolt system. Very interesting. Very forward thinking. But, you know, it is what it is. The early guns had this trigger style charging handle under the carry handle. The rear sight is adjustable in here. 
these would have bolt hold opens. The early guns would have this sticking out the back. Later they would go to more of a telescoping handle, but the, the German trials guns would still have the original style handle. We would have a port door to cover it. You get the idea, I bet. Most of you have experience. Conventional selector on the side. Bolt release. You could also use this as a bolt hole open. Like the rest, this was chambered for 7.62 NATO. Unlike the rest, these were very, very lightweight. The original guns were around seven and a half pounds, depending on the variant. Some of them got closer to seven, some of them got closer to eight, but in that seven and a half pound range. So this would have been by far the lightest gun in the trials and would kind of vie with the uh, set me for the shortest gun. These actually did quite well. We have some records showing that the Germans were very impressed. A lot of people were impressed with the AR-10. The U.S. military was kind of one of the ones that didn't take, even though people didn't adopt these, a lot of them gave it notice and, and, and really appreciated the forward thinking. I think a lot of people saw this as the future. It's just the 223 round had not been quite introduced for it yet. But yeah, they did quite well in the trials by most accounts. And the Germans were interested in it. They even looked into what manufacturing and all that would be. But then that kind of gets into more of the business end of things. And the whole armor light contracting out to AI, which was in the Netherlands, it... It got complicated. They didn't have the production capacity to really deliver what Germany might need, and the gun was still being developed, still being perfected, had little things worked out. If you look at a late Portuguese, you'll see several updates compared to the, the, um, the early guns like the Cubans. So they were continuing to work with it. So yeah, it, it just wasn't probably gonna happen, unfortunately, but it gets into more of that. And of course, later, the uh, the the Dutch government would get a little weird about exports, and then they would just shut down AI altogether just a couple of years later. So even if Germany had adopted the G4, they could have been left high and dry if they had not already have a manufacturing system set up for it, which they might have done by the time that uh, AI was closed, but I don't know, never know. But yeah, you do see some pretty glowing reports of this guy from those trials. These did use drop-free mags, whereas the first couple we looked at used rock-in. Now this is a modern Brownells mag, but the early ones were very similar. They were uh, made very affordably. They were alloy, kind of folded and welded together, and they would have a waffle pattern, much like the early two, 223 mags. Very interesting, and it's it's great that they gave the, the AR-10 a fair chance, unlike the U.S. But, to be fair, the AR-10 was really too late for the U.S. trials. A year or two can make all the difference. But, it was good, but all around just not a good enough package for what West Germany needed. And so the 135 went their way after the trials, and that was that. And really, AI, AR-10 production would be suspended in just a couple of years. I think it was 61, and that would be about that for this thing. We have other videos on both the Brownells and the AR-10, so check that out if you're interested. It's definitely a cool gun. I like how light it is. It's definitely the most forward-thinking of the ones that they tried out. And now for, of course, the winner. Now, as I said, this is my Mars Set Me Sport. This w was made in the mid and late 60s. So is a Model C, which was kind of the final evolution. But the trials guns would be modified, updated Model Bs. So. Good enough. I thought this would be a closer approximation than a more modern like HK-91 because that's uh, a lot of changes. The G3 Trials guns would have wood furniture. They would have the earlier style flash hider. They would be grenade launcher capable. They would use modified sights 
from the set me. Obviously, ignoring these scope mounts, those weren't there. Those are for the sporter. Would have a push pin lower, of course. Taking steel 20 round mags. Yeah. The set me was almost always destined to win, frankly. It was the one that Germany had shown the most interest in for years, but I think they were waiting for Spain to really mature it. It had German roots, so even though it wasn't made here as such, it at least had a Germanic connection. It was also quite affordable to make and, uh, you know, reasonably lightweight too, believe it or not. We have a barrel that's just a hair under 18 inches. Movable flash hider. Bayonet lug is up here. Like the 510, the Swiss gun, this is a roller delay. It is a different system though. They're different styling, but same principle. Again, no gas tube or gas system. This is just a caulking tube. No bolt hold open again. Just an acceptable military trigger. What's interesting, it both saves on cost and weight, the receivers, and this is really kind of an evolution from that STG-45, were stamped steel that was folded over and welded. A very modern technique. Now the wood furniture was kind of traditional, but they would quickly go over to polymer furniture. So they would have a polymer pistol grip. They would feed from the 20 round mags that are kind of a hybrid between a drop free straight in like the AR-10 or the rock and lock like the FAO. Kind of a little of both, frankly. Selector is in the usual position. So these were lighter, cheaper, and proved to be very reliable in trials. This system, used with the proper ammo, is very reliable. On the other hand, because it is relatively light, recoil can be stout, especially in full auto. Maybe not as bad as an M14, but probably more so than most FALs, especially because the FAL has an adjustable gas system. You can kind of tune it to minimize recoil, but not with the, uh, the Setme or G3. As I said, they would acquire about 400 Model A's, and Setme would work with H and K to kind of improve it. This would first lead to the Model B in 1958, and then the modified trials guns for West Germany. And this version, the early, the Proto G3, also HK designated it as the HK31, would be officially declared the winner and adopted in January of 1959. Now, interestingly, HK did not purchase the production rights from Set Me in Spain. Another company out of the Netherlands, NWM, had the European the international rights to the Set Me. And so it was actually this company that Germany, the German, the West German government, would negotiate with for production rights. They would obtain them, and they would assign G3 production to H and K, of course, because they'd already had a lot of experience working with these. They knew how to build them. And another company, Ryan Mittal, who had been around for quite a long time. And both companies would produce the G3 through the G3, A3, and so on for the uh, West German government and, you know, mostly the military. Interestingly, you see, it wasn't initially a true H and K design. HK just played a part in it. But in 1969, Rhein Metall ceased production of the G3. There were some negotiations going on there with the, uh, the, uh, the MG trials story for another day. And then in 1977, really after the government had stopped buying G3s, the gun was starting to get rather long in the tooth after 20 years, the German government, who was holding the rights, would cede everything over to H&K. So by 1977, this became a, a, the 
G3 became a true HK design, which is good because they're the ones who really progressed it. You know, okay, the original 308 version was kind of not totally theirs, but of course they would make the HK33 in 223. They'd even more famously make the MP5 in 9mm, the MP5K, so on, so on, and so on, and that's not even getting into this guns like the HK53 and HK21 and all kinds of, they, they took this roller delay system and really ran with it, and now they're very well known for it. So, a gun not terribly dissimilar from this beat out guns not terribly dissimilar from these, and that's what West Germany would use throughout really the duration of the Cold War. The G3 would not be officially retired, or at least a replacement selected, until 1997. That gets into our G36 video. And of course you don't just replace guns overnight when you need over 100,000, so it took a number of years. There were still G3s in, at that time, unified German service well into the 21st century. So it, uh, it hung around for nearly a half century. And again, it's kind of whole design and everything could be traced back to the, you know, last year or so of World War II. Very cool. I mean, I think a lot of people like the HK, but they don't realize all the history behind it with the Setme and West Germany and how the Cold War played a major role. Well, I wanted to do this video just because I had all the guns for the trials here. Thought, eh, that sounds fun. Should be a neat video to do. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want more detailed histories of these guns, we, we have individual videos. As you see, this one's already long enough, so I didn't want to go too deep. But I thought a side-by-side -side comparison would be kind of cool. And I was really waiting on this gun, the Brownells, complete the set. God, this thing is definitely the lightest and definitely the most modern looking back. But at the time, to be fair, it was terribly new and new things often have issues. And of course, the Swiss gun here was, oh, excuse me, the, the FAL here was already on its way out. Uh, there, since they couldn't get a production license, I think the G1 was only in the trials just as a, as a um, what am I trying to say, guys? You know, a standard, a control, if you will. Because they knew it worked. And they also knew it's kind of quirks. Because the FAL, while one of my favorite guns, is not perfect. But many, many other nations found them quite acceptable. It's just that FN was not keen on giving the Germans the rights to make them. And I cannot really blame them. And of course, the Swiss gun here was just kind of a wild card to throw in to try out. It is neat. I think it would have been a lot of fun to try out, for sure. But I doubt it ever was a serious contender. Well, if you have any questions or comments, please post them below. We always appreciate that and enjoy talking with you. If you like the video, and didn't fall asleep, we'd appreciate a click for like. And if you'd like to help support the channel a bit, please go check out our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we will catch you next time.